one. No one imagined that four years of bloodshed and suffering lay ahead. Gun manufacturing and design had improved dramatically since the American Revolution. Yet there was little attempt to revise existing battlefield tactics to keep pace with new technological advances in weapons. Throughout the war, field commanders on both sides used outmoded strategies that doomed their men to certain death. Troops were lined up shoulder to shoulder and marched in a deadly frontal assault directly into a wall of musket fire. Only through sheer numbers, it was thought, could a defended position be taken. The tactics that were used are generally called Napoleonic tactics, which are linear tactics. The earlier weapons, the smoothbore weapons, the weapons that were inaccurate uh, at 100 yards on individual targets, were the basic weapons of Napoleonic tactics. The manufacture of infantry weapons had come a long way since the time of Napoleon, particularly the musket. In 1855, the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts perfected the Springfield Rifled Musket, the most widely used gun in the Civil War. The rifling, or the machining of spiral grooves in the barrel, gave projectile stability and dramatically increased accuracy. The tactical manuals did not modernize their text when the rifle musket was adopted uh, in 1855. They were using outmoded tactics with modern weapons. The enlisted man who was on the firing line figured it out quickly uh, that they were the weapons they were using were killing at three to five hundred yards instead of the old eighty to a hundred yards. Almost a million Springfields were utilized by both sides in the Civil War. They were reliable, rugged, simple in construction, and finely engineered. The Springfield, along with a similarly modeled Enfield, a British import, were the guns responsible for more deaths than any other weapon during the Civil War. Originally produced at a cost of $13.93 per gun, a Springfield in good condition can now bring $2,000 at auction. Among its innovations was the interchangeability of parts. With uh, the machinery capable of producing firearms made from interchangeable parts, you can produce a lot more of them a lot quicker. Uh, if during a battle uh, you broke a piece off of your gun, say the hammer or the mainspring, you could pretty much pick a mainspring off of another gun and with maybe some minor fitting, uh, interchange that broken part with the part that you needed to make your gun function again. Another technological innovation around the time of the Civil War was a new and highly destructive projectile made for the musket, the mini ball. It was developed in France in 1849 by Captain Minet of the uh, French, French Army. Uh, the, the mini ball itself is, uh, is a conical shaped uh, projectile, whereas most of the uh, firearms up to that time had incorporated a, a round lead ball. A simple yet revolutionary design, the mini ball was utilized by both sides during the war and was probably the single greatest cause of battlefield casualties. The wounds that uh, were created by a slow moving large projectile that was relatively soft by nature were horrific. The mini ball, upon penetration, it would expand because it was soft lead. Because of its low velocity, it had a tendency to wander if it impacted bone. Instead of breaking through the bone, it would shatter the bone and travel up the bone. It was hard to trace the trajectory once it entered the body. Because of the size, because of the low velocity, it had a tendency to inflict very horrible wounds. The mini ball was a godsend for the soldier in the field because its slightly smaller diameter allowed for easier loading of the musket. But for a wounded soldier, 
the mini ball often proved to be his worst nightmare. Medical science was so far behind military science that it was a tragedy. Medical science had no idea of infection, uh, had no idea of sterilization. Probing was done with a dirty finger. When an extremity was hit, if it was shattered, an arm or a leg, the simple solution was immediate amputation, which automatically gave the poor soldier an infection that he would rarely survive if he even survived the shock. If a soldier was hit in the body or the head, he was usually laid aside because the surgeons felt that there was no point in wasting time on a wound that would be surely mortal. The horrors inflicted by a more effective combination of rifled musket and the mini ball were shocking. For hundreds of thousands of soldiers like Colonel T.D. Kingsley, the carnage was almost beyond belief. I never wish to see another such time as the 27th of May. The doctors used a large cotton press for the butchering room. And when I was carried into the building and looked about, I could not help comparing the surgeons to fiends. All around the ground lay the wounded men. Some of them were shrieking, some cursing and swearing, and some praying. In the middle of the room were dissecting tables, and they were covered with blood all over them. And by the sides of the tables was a heap of feet, legs, and arms. T.D. Kingsley, 1863. But the mini ball and the Springfield musket that fired it were by no means the ultimate weapons. Loading the musket was a cumbersome process that allowed a soldier to fire only two to three rounds per minute. The soldier in battle uh, would take a cartridge from his uh, cartridge box and uh, prepare to load the gun by biting off the end of the cartridge. He would tear off the cartridge, pour the powder down the muzzle, seat the, uh, the mini ball, draw his rammer, and then forcing the round and the powder down to the breech of the gun. We then raise the gun up again to chest height, remove a percussion cap from the side pouch, place the percussion cap on the cone, and then they were to return to shoulder arms. They were ready to commence fire. The entire process took some nine steps and was especially difficult for the soldier caught in a prone position. If any one part of the procedure was performed incorrectly, the gun would not fire. The Battle of Gettysburg dramatized this in a striking way. Of the 37,000 muskets salvaged after the battle, 24,000 were improperly loaded. During battlefield situations, soldiers sometimes became so frightened that they would pour powder and ball down the muzzle, ram it home, and then forget to cap and shoot the gun. After Gettysburg, tens of thousands of guns were found that had more than one load down the muzzle. And after a while, when you put in a certain number of charges, when you, if you do cap it and pull the trigger, the gun's going to explode. The American Civil War was the final glory of the musket. The times demanded a more reliable weapon for the field soldier. It was a challenge the industry of the North was eagerly preparing to meet. A new kind of repeating rifle was already on the horizon. To the Civil War soldier, the musket, though effective, had obvious limitations. There was urgent need for a repeating weapon that could fire several bullets in rapid succession. But such a weapon had only become feasible with the perfection of a reliable, self-contained cartridge. Early cartridges had been unstable, susceptible to moisture, and often malfunctioned. Finally, a copper case was developed to house the fulminate in powder. A bullet was seated on top. By 1861, the self-contained cartridge had been a working reality for several years. Breech-loading firearms uh, had been developed uh, in the years prior to the Civil War, and with the development of the metallic or the self-contained cartridge, offered the soldier an opportunity to load and fire a firearm with much greater uh, rapidity. By late 1861, with the war in full swing, 
The race was on to develop a repeating rifle that could utilize this new self-contained cartridge technology. This is the Henry rifle, one of the most uh, important of repeating firearms made in the Civil War period, even though only about 1,700 were used by uh, U.S. ordinance um, and issued to troops. Many thousands were bought and issued by militia units. Manufactured for the Union by Oliver Winchester, the Henry's rapid-fire capability so impressed soldiers that they nicknamed it the gun you loaded on Sunday and shot all week. The Henry rifle with its uh, multi-shot magazine and uh, rapid-firing lever allowed the trooper to fire as many as uh, 60 shots in a minute. So the Henry rifle was one of the most important innovations of the war. A direct precursor to the Winchester rifle, the Henry was originally sold to the U.S. Army for the then exorbitant price of $40. An original Henry can now command a sum of over $25,000. Despite his best efforts, Winchester was unable to supply the Henry to Union troops in sufficient quantities. Both the intricately designed gun and its ammunition proved too difficult to assemble in large numbers. But another manufacturer from Connecticut, Christopher Spencer, overcame those problems and created his own breech-loading repeater called the Spencer. Stronger and simpler in construction, this weapon was nicknamed the Horizontal Shot Tower by stunned Confederate troops, unlucky enough to come under its direct fire. Spencer, developed by Christopher Minor Spencer, had a seven-shot tube magazine in the breech that allowed it to be fired seven times by the operating of a lever underneath the weapon and the cocking of a hammer. By dropping the lever, you extracted the fired round and automatically loaded a new round. You cocked the hammer and fired the weapon. Uh, it meant that this weapon could be fired as rapidly as it could be operated, which gave the individual with this weapon a terrific advantage. The Spencer was an immediate success with Union soldiers in the field. Before long, exuberant testimonials were pouring into the company offices. It is admitted by all who have witnessed our practice that we have the best gun in the Army. On long ranges, they exceed our expectations. Captain G.M. Barber, Ohio Sharpshooters. I am firmly of the opinion that 1,500 men armed with the Spencer carbine are more than a match for 2,500 armed with any other firearm. George Armstrong Custer, Brigadier General. By 1863, the Spencer was fast becoming the weapon of choice. But its unique use of self-contained cartridges also gave the Spencer another unexpected quality, which was immensely valuable to Union forces. The Confederate forces captured a large number of Spencer rifles and carbines during the course of the war, particularly in 1864. And Confederate ordnance facilities tried to manufacture Spencer cartridges, but they never had the technical capability to spin a copper case and therefore could never make the ammunition. And the Confederates who were lucky enough to pick up a Spencer on the battlefield uh, only had the use of it as long as they could capture ammunition. Perhaps the Spencer earned its greatest fame on June 24, 1863, at the Battle of Hoover's Gap. Union Colonel John Thomas Wilder's Lightning Brigade suddenly found itself face to face with a Confederate force of superior numbers. For Wilder's men, the Spencers made all the difference. One of my regiments fairly defeated a rebel brigade of five regiments. They admitted a loss of over 500, while our loss was 47. My men feel as if it is impossible to be whipped, and the confidence inspired by these arms added to their terribly destructive capacity fully quadruples the effectiveness of my command. Colonel John Thomas Wilder, commanding the 1st Mounted Brigade of the 17th Indiana Volunteers. Hoover's 
Gap was the first battle in history in which repeating rifles gave troops a significant advantage. Despite this, the Union Ordnance Department in Washington, which had initially ordered 10,000 Spencers, refused to order any more. General Ripley, the chief of ordnance for the Union Army, felt that would be too much of a wasteful expenditure of ammunition on the part of the Union marksmen that if they were able to fire 16 rounds in 10 seconds, then the uh, cost of keeping the Union Army in the field with ammunition up to that point would be astronomical. He could afford to keep an army in the field that fired three shots in one minute, but 16 shots in 10 seconds was, was, was an expensive proposition. He also felt that a soldier that was able to fire that fast wouldn't take such care in choosing his targets that there would be a lot of wasteful ammunition spent. But Christopher Spencer, then only 27 years old, refused to take no for an answer. He had other plans, namely the complete arming of all Union forces with his repeating rifle and the termination of Springfield musket production. Spencer bypassed Ripley and arranged a personal audience with President Lincoln to plead his case. On the 18th of August, 1863, I arrived at the White House with the rifle in hand and was immediately ushered into the executive room. I found the president alone. With brief introduction, I took the rifle from its case and presented it to him. Looking it over carefully and handling it as one familiar with firearms, he requested me to take it apart to show the inwardness of the thing. Lincoln was impressed and quickly made arrangements for a private demonstration with this new repeating weapon. Near where the Washington Memorial now stands, a Union officer set up a target as Lincoln and Spencer prepared to fire. The rifle contains seven cartridges. Mr. Lincoln's first shot was low, but the next shot hit the bullseye, and the other five were close around it. Now, says he, we will let the inventor try it. Being in almost daily practice, I naturally beat the president a little. Well, he said, you are younger than I am, have a better eye, and a steadier nerve. Christopher Spencer, 1863. Spencer's demonstration had the desired effect. Lincoln ordered the War Department to supply as many troops as possible with Spencer rifles. By the end of the war, 144,000 were made and over 58 million cartridges ordered. The tide had changed. Within 20 years, repeating guns became the dominant weapon of all soldiers in land wars. At the same time, new advances in handguns were also assuring that a more deadly era of warfare had begun. At the start of the Civil War, the U.S. Ordnance Department was reluctant to recommend the use of revolvers as a standard issue firearm. But that soon changed as the practicality became apparent. Revolvers were reliable, close-range, multiple-firing weapons that were soon carried by almost every cavalryman, artillery crew, and officer on both sides. Though most revolvers used in the Civil War were muzzle-loading weapons, many had special innovations which even today stand out as technological marvels. One of the truly remarkable revolvers developed around the time of the Civil War was the Lamat, invented by Dr. Jean Alexander Lamat of New Orleans. One of its unique features was that the center pin was actually hollowed, so it took a 16-gauge shotgun uh, buckshot, and the revolver barrel itself had in the cylinder nine shots in 42 caliber. It was a muzzle loader, so here is the loading lever on the side of the barrel. In order to fire the center barrel, you pushed down an aperture on the hammer and a nipple went here. In order to fire the revolver cylinder, you switched the uh, firing aperture up, back up on the hammer and you could fire those nine shots. A formidable weapon, using a Lamat in combat, was like having a revolver and a shotgun all in one. I can't imagine what a handheld 16-gauge shotgun would be like, but I, I would certainly think it would get your attention. Uh, it would obviously be devastating at close range. 3,000 Lamats were used by the Confederacy during the war. Among its patrons was the famous rebel cavalry general, Jeb Stuart. 
Even though it was an expensive weapon to own during the war, costing almost $50, a Lamad in good condition now is worth over $15,000. Though Lamad's employed several extraordinary design features, the most popular handgun of the war was manufactured by a charismatic entrepreneur from Connecticut named Samuel Colt. Samuel Colt in 1836 is credited with being the father of the revolver, a handheld gun that was able to discharge multiple rounds uh, with successive working of the action of the gun. Uh, the revolving gun replaced the standard pistol of the period, which was, like the rifles of the period, a single-shot, muzzle-loading implement. Colt's genius as an inventor was to manufacture a handheld weapon that would stand up to the rigors of warfare. The Colt Army Revolver Model 1860 was a simple, rugged, and reliable single-action handgun. It had an improved loading lever system over previous models called a rack and pinion. It had uh, standard uh, uh, an eight inch barrel which was uh, perfect ballistically for the best accuracy. It was a six shooter and it was made of the finest uh, steel and, and uh, was as modern as Colt had ever made any handgun. The 1860 Army Colt was the most popular and widely distributed revolver of the Civil War. Approximately 200,000 were made, and a great many of those were issued to uh, Union troops. But Sam Colt wasn't just one of the greatest arms inventors and manufacturers of the 19th century. He was also a shrewd businessman. The advertising of the day said uh, the Colt revolver was the world's right arm. Others said that if God hadn't created men equal, Samuel Colt had made them equal. There are still extant beautiful case sets of presentation Colt revolvers given to secretaries of war, chief of the ordnance department, general officers of any importance, and also uh, minor ordnance officers that might sit on boards that would select weapons. So Colt was really, uh, he was a businessman first and possibly an inventor second. Today, a Colt 1860 revolver can be bought for $1,500. A specially engraved model is worth many times more than that. But Colt's ambition went beyond simply manufacturing the most popular handgun of the war. The beginning of the war, Sam Colt, who had always billed himself as Colonel Colt, had tried to raise a regiment to take into the field at the outset of the war. And in fact, it offered his services to the United States government and then to the state of Connecticut, uh, his home state, uh, to, to allow him to uh, personally, at his expense, arm and equip, uniform an entire regiment of men uh, carrying Colt revolving rifles. In fact, those offers were turned down. Colt never did take the field as a, uh, as a military officer. However, Sam Colt did rule the wartime revolver industry because of his ability to manufacture mass quantities of guns. He may also have damaged his reputation by overcharging for them. He priced his guns at $25 a piece, but it only cost him half as much to produce one. An enterprising gunmaker from New York State saw this greediness on Colt's part as an opportunity for himself. Eli Remington Jr. made a revolver that was actually preferred by combat-hardened officers. Remington produced a solid frame revolver, which was very strong, uh, very reliable, uh, not subject to breakage as much as Colt's. But Remington didn't have the public relations department that Colt did. Remington was only able to convince the Ordnance Department to purchase 5,000 of his new Army Model 44 revolvers. Then in 1862, Remington testified in the Ordnance Commission hearings that he could manufacture his revolvers for as little as $12 a piece. In addition, he said he could produce any other design, including Colts, for the same low price. Remington and his sons who were in business with him offered a very reliable firearm. They weren't in for profiteering as it had been charges that had been leveled at, at other manufacturers uh, such as Colt. The Colt Company's $25 a gun bonanza was at an end and Remington was filling the gap. 
By 1865, Remington had supplied 125,000 revolvers to the U.S. Army, and Colt revolvers were selling for the reduced price of $14.50 a gun. The rapid development in the design of small arms during the Civil War was nothing short of revolutionary. And as the weapons changed, so too did the nature of war. The conflict was being played out on a grand scale, a scale which demanded even larger and more destructive weapons. As with repeaters and revolvers, light artillery in the Civil War was making significant advances. These new weapons of death were astounding in their ability to kill on a massive scale. Used by both sides, the real workhorse of the Civil War was a piece of light artillery called the Napoleon. Named after Emperor Napoleon III of France, this brass smoothbore could fire a projectile over 1,600 yards. But its deadly effectiveness was most apparent at much closer range. It was loaded with a piece of ammunition called canister. And that was essentially a can with about 27 smaller round balls in it. And when that was fired, just like a shotgun, it exploded. The shot dispersed over a fairly large area, especially if, if you were uh, an attacking army at 300 yards away. By the time the canister got to you, it was very, very large, very wide, and very destructive. And there are accounts in the Civil War of, of soldiers charging up to a Napoleon gun that goes off and just becoming uh, vaporized. Uh, it was a very, very effective weapon, and this is one of the reasons why tactics change. The effect of a Napoleon was devastating. Like gigantic shotguns, Napoleons loaded with canisters caused more casualties than all other artillery projectiles combined. And yet in battle after battle, rows of men lined up and charged these mounted artillery pieces. Most would be butchered. The Civil War soldier usually was part of a unit that was raised from his hometown or his home county. Uh, everybody in his company was a personal friend or an acquaintance. There were strong family bonds, intermarriages between families. These soldiers refused to run because they knew that they were going to have to go back to their communities after the war if they survived and live with these people. They had a common esprit de corps, a common hope of survival, a common spirituality, if you will. But they all believed they had to show that they could do their best to their neighbors. And they would be disgraced, uh, absolutely disgraced, if they showed the white feather and ran. And I think this is one of the primary reasons that seasoned soldiers, knowing full well what double canister would do to their ranks, would advance without hesitation into obvious oblivion. They knew they were going to die, but they preferred an honorable death over uh, what they perceived as cowardice. As the land war progressed and the death toll mounted, a new form of warfare was taking place on the seas. Navies on both sides were quickly learning that wooden ships of war were increasingly vulnerable to artillery, which, thanks in part to rifling, was becoming larger and more accurate. The Union and Confederacy began retrofitting the exterior of their ships with thick sheets of iron, solid protection against incoming artillery shells. The iron sheets were slanted, causing the projectiles to expend their force upward. It would ricochet off and away from the ship. A brilliant Swedish inventor named John Ericsson saw these new ironclads being built and was hard at work on an invention that would revolutionize naval warfare. The Federals, to combat the Confederate ironclads, developed a ship uh, that had a unique capability of a revolving turret. This was called a cheese box on a raft, and John Erickson developed it, and it actually from the beginning until it hit the water was 100 days construction time. The USS Monitor was completed on January 30, 1862, 
and was one of the strangest sights ever seen in the water. The ship's deck was only 14 inches above the waterline. Waves splashed on her surface. With so little exterior to protect, the ship's armor could be focused on her gun turret. Inside that turret were two 11-inch smoothbore Dahlgrens, which shot a solid projectile weighing 180 pounds. Firing could take place once every two minutes. It had a steam-driven turret. It only mounted two guns. These guns were protected inside this revolving turret. They could be withdrawn and the portholes shuttered so the guns could be reloaded in relative sa safety. And then the guns run out and fired at the Confederate antagonist. The monitor engaged the Confederate ironclad Virginia, otherwise known as the Merrimack, at Hampton Roads, Virginia, on March 9, 1862. It was one of the most important naval battles in history, marking the end of the wooden navy and the beginning of the armored cruiser. Though the battle lasted only two hours, the world saw, for the first time, the deadly value of a rotating gun in naval combat. The ironclads of the Confederates had their guns mounted in broadside primarily, also a stern gun, but these were the configuration of the old Navy. The whole ship had to be maneuvered so that the broadside could fire. The monitor, on the other hand, could swivel the turret, could turn its turret almost 360 degrees and fire in any direction. So the ship itself did not have to be maneuvered, the turret could be turned. It was a design concept for battleship guns which remained seminal through the 20th century. But conditions inside the turret were something less than advanced. The turrets of the Monitor class were made of armor plate. They did have grates, open grates on the top, so he could escape. But the interior of the turret was cramped. It was dark. It was incredibly smoky. You have to try and imagine what it must have felt like for the sailors manning the guns to hear 100 and 200 pound projectiles hitting the outside of the turret. Uh, a continuous din, and it's not really a surprise that many sailors who served on ironclads and applied for pensions after the war complained of total 100% deafness from ruptured eardrums due to the concussion sustained working guns and ironclad turrets. The type of innovative thinking exhibited in shipbuilding was also being applied to the science of rapid-fire artillery. In an effort to give the soldier even more firepower, an unusual class of weapons, known as volley guns, were being experimented with in the field. Volley guns are multi-shot devices that closely resembled weapons projected by Leonardo da Vinci and date back to the 16th century. The Vandenberg volley gun had anywhere from 85 to 451 barrels. They could be fired individually or all at once. Another was the Billinghurst Requa gun. Requiring a crew of three, the gun was usually mounted on wheels and could be fired up to seven times in a minute. It was a collection of barrels that were fired by one percussion cap, and as the first cartridges went off, the flame spread from cartridge to cartridge, and they all went off. Bam, 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 bam. With the introduction of each new weapon, it was becoming apparent that Napoleonic tactics were completely outmoded. Based on weapons technology from earlier in the century, romantic notions of battle had less and less significance. Those tactics were becoming supplanted by the cold, hard mechanization of the Civil War. Soon, one of the last great battles of the war would be fought and it would help shape battle tactics well into the next century. By 1864, the overwhelming strength of the North was bearing down hard on the Confederacy, and new types of heavy guns were forever changing the way wars were to be fought. The Siege of Charleston saw the Union Army employ some of the biggest guns in use anywhere in the world. 
the siege of Charleston, which was a long, protracted affair, the Union Army, desperate to capture this place where what they would have called the rebellion began, you see a variety of heavy ordnance brought to bear not just on the defenses of Charleston, not just on the military fortifications, but on the town itself. You even see one huge gun that was nicknamed the Swamp Angel, erected on an artificial island, basically built out of, out of sandbags and earth in the middle of a swamp. that can lob a shell several miles into Charleston so that the people of the city literally going about their business would have scant warning before the shriek and the explosion of this shell. Other guns were employed as well. The Rodman weighed 117,000 pounds and could fire a half-ton projectile 8,000 yards. And the Whitworth could blast an 80-pound projectile almost 14,000 yards, a distance of more than seven miles. But the big guns that would essentially just lob a shell for however many miles into the enemy position, are you really not sure what you're going to be hitting with that? And that is a very modern way of waging war. It's not the, the, the gentleman's war. It's not, it's not uh, the Napoleonic way of waging war. It's not war as a glory. And certainly you see more of that as the Civil War goes on. While they cause no military damage, the effect on civilian morale was devastating uh, because the city uh, knew that they were under fire at any given time at the will of the Union blockading forces. Anxious to take the Confederate capital, Union troops in 1864 laid siege to Richmond's last line of defense, Petersburg. In this final great battle of the Civil War, the army of Ulysses S. Grant faced off directly against Robert E. Lee's forces. By now, leaders on both sides had come to appreciate the advances made by guns and artillery. In place of thousands of men being sent to their deaths in futile charges against advanced weaponry, soldiers were instead hunkering down in trenches. But Petersburg certainly, one cannot look at those images of, of the trenches and the defenses in, in the muddy, uh, corpse-strewn uh, battlefields there and not think of, of the First World War. Uh, certainly, Petersburg, because of that visual record we have, is, is one of the more dr dramatic and obvious examples of the Civil War hearkening forward to, to a more modern era of warfare. Foreshadowing the need for mobile artillery in later wars, the Union Army placed a 13-inch mortar on a railway carriage and used it to shell Confederate forces protecting Petersburg. Soldiers would position the carriage on a curved track and aim the gun by moving it back and forth. Both sides had also developed several primitive machine guns. The Ager machine gun, nicknamed the coffee mill, could fire up to 120 rounds a minute. The rate was kept low for fear of overheating the barrel. The Union coffee mill gun uh, gets its name from the fact that it had a hopper on top that looked like a coffee mill, and these preloaded cartridges were dropped into the hopper, and the crank fed them into uh, the mechanism of the gun. The Williams machine gun was supposed to be the Confederate's secret weapon, and the Confederacy ordered 42 of them. It fired 65 rounds per minute, but extended firing overheated the barrel, a casualty of the poor quality of Confederate steel. But the siege of Petersburg saw the first use of another rapid-fire gun that became the forerunner of the modern machine gun. Known as the Gatling gun, its inventor Richard J. Gatling of North Carolina took out the first patents on his gun in 1862. It was an ingenious invention, though it was far from perfect. The gun tended to jam, it was heavy, and sustained firing produced a great deal of smoke. But the use of six rotating barrels was a clever solution to the difficulty of overheating, and a Gatling was capable of firing between 200 and 400 rounds a minute. In a letter he wrote to uh, Samuel Colt's widow uh, following the, uh, the Civil War, uh, Dr. Gatling uh, wrote how his inspiration for the development of the Gatling gun had come about. And he had witnessed uh, troops returning uh, from the front 
uh, at a local train station near his home in the Midwest and had seen the ravages of the wounds that these soldiers had, had were carrying, tremendous damage and suffering that, that these uh, poor guys were, were undergoing as, as, as they were being returned to their homes to convalesce. Uh, it struck him that if he could develop a gun uh, that was so terrible in, its, uh, in the amount of firepower it could lay down, uh, that one army equipped with, uh, with a number of these guns would intimidate any other army into just realizing the futility of, uh, of attacking and, uh, and cease to, uh, to remain in the field. Ironically, in subsequent years, Gatling's invention would have the opposite effect. It made battlefields many times more deadly. But during the Civil War, his attempts to sell this gun to the Ordnance Department were rejected. However, Union General Benjamin Butler was convinced of their effectiveness, and with $1,000 of his own money, privately purchased 12 Gatlings. In 1865, he had his troops employ them during the Siege of Petersburg. General Benjamin Butler was one of the more unusual uh, Civil War generals and that he uh, was a politician, uh, he was a governor, uh, he had a little military training, but he was a brilliant man. Butler bought weapons that he considered uh, to be of some use to him, and one of the weapons that he bought was a battery of Gatling guns. Despite Butler's purchase, Colonel Ripley of the Union Ordnance Office refused to consider the need for a Gatling gun. The irony is that the North could have produced a reliable machine gun, like the Gatling, in sufficient quantities to have significantly influenced the outcome of the war. But men of limited vision chose to ignore a concept that would soon become a standard feature of warfare throughout the world. The Civil War was a preview of the shape of things to come and marked an important transition in the science of guns. Technology had moved these machines of war far beyond those found in Napoleon's time and thrust the tactics of warfare well into the future. Some 50 years later, when war breaks out on the Western Front of Europe, things seem to pick up technologically or tactically where they left off at Petersburg in 1865. No longer could esprit de corps of the unit carry the battlefield. You had to have superior firepower to breach the enemy's lines and against a uh, firm, entrenched position that was a uh, near impossibility. More Americans were killed in the Civil War than all other American wars combined. It was the first modern war and foreshadowed the horrors to come in the beginning of the next century. But any war, especially one as brutal as the American Civil War, proves that technological innovation can contribute to victory, but only at a horrible cost of flesh and blood.